Winfred Yu is one of the most recognized faces in the Asian high stakes poker scene. As a president of the Poker King Club, he was one of the founding members of the big game in Macau. And in this episode of I Am High Stakes Poker, Yu talks to us about the jobs that he had before the game. He also talks to us about the first time he ever played poker and how he turned around and saw Daniel Negreanu sitting in his game. And how he moved from Canada to Macau with only Hong Kong dollar 50,000 in his pocket, three families to feed, and turned out to be one of the most successful imports of poker into that scene in his generation. Hey Winfred, welcome to I Am High Stakes Poker. How are you doing today? I'm doing good, thank you very much. I was just uh, saying how, how I love your fashion sense. <laughs> Even I don't play good, I try to look good. <laughs> <laughs> what did you say to me earlier on? Yeah, if I can't be the best poker player, I'll be the w best dressed poker player. De definitely, definitely. I think it's like people look up to um, uh, to poker not only uh, into just staying on the table, but it's a lifestyle mm. that we try to, um, in our poker business, we try to promote the lifestyle. You know, uh, people not only coming to enjoy their time in the, uh, in the tournament, we want them to have fun, come to shopping, to look good, you know, into the, uh, more into the entertainment and fashion style. You're not a fan of the old, uh, the people who rock up in their bathrobe and their, and their slippers then? Everybody got that different style, I'm sure, I'm sure. Somebody with their cowboy hats that used to be, you know, in that, and then the shades, the, the hoodies and all that, and, um, and later on the scarves and all these different, different styles of, uh, uh, they try to make them, you know, to make them feel good and looks good, I think. Was you one of the cool kids uh, when, you, when you was growing up? Was you, you know, was fashion really important for you when you was a kid? Definitely not, definitely not. I think I, I um, when I immigrated to Canada when I was like 14, I'm just being a, a actually I'm a nerd. That are glasses and just bookworm type. <laughs> and nobody thinks that I, you know, what happened to you? Somebody thinks like, <laughs> How did it, you become it, so cool? Yeah, something hit your head or something that <laughs> I, you change. And uh, people don't believe that I, I didn't even, I don't even think I date the first girl until I was like 19 or something. I didn't even go out. I'm not even allowed to go out by myself before I was 15. So I'm a totally nerd. So before you uh, immigrated to Canada, where, where did you grow up in before your I was teens? born in Hong Kong uh -huh. and grew up in Hong Kong until I was like, like uh, close to 14. Mm -hmm. And what was it? What was life like in Hong Kong back then? Um, as I said, it's just school mm -hmm. and home. That's it. And then go over with the par parents to uh, uh, movies, hang out with my cousins on the weekend. That's about it. How come you uh, you wasn't allowed to? What did you say? You, you didn't really go out at all? Yeah, like, it's pretty, like my parents kind of like. You are know, they we, straight? They, yeah, very straight. They don't allow me to go out by myself until I was like I didn't think I don't think I even go out by myself until I was like thirteen to go out with my cousins and all that. Mm -hmm. Is that uh, because they're protective of you? Yeah, I think so. Yeah, yeah. Think and so. and uh, how do they feel now when now you're uh, you know you're, you're earning a living through poker and, and of a business sense? I think they in in my families and my 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 parents and you know they are pretty open about it. I guess in the traditional sort of big family that I have, they kind of like feel like you are the bad boy, you know, in the gambling. Like they don't they don't look at it as a gaming industry. Uh -huh. You know, you're a gambler, you, you know, you're sick, man. Uh, kind of like um, one of the bad boy in the, in, in, in the family. And nobody's, I guess, I like, think um, poker player is a career. Hmm. Um, actually, I took it from uh, this year from when I was in North America, just a poker player uh, into a poker business in Macau. I think they change this and make them open up, especially when Macau has a booming gaming industry. So now they look at it as a poker is part of the whole big picture. So it doesn't feel like poker is a crime anymore. You know? Was it was it something that you um, that you had to try really hard to like convince them, like sitting down repeatedly and trying to explain like what you was doing? I guess like from all along there, I wasn't the type that like sitting in the office, like from nine to five, I can sit tight in the office, look at my computer. Uh, I'm not that type, so they already knew. 
um, actually uh, any kind of game of chance or fun stuff or uh, uh, not only poker like you know before we have poker in in Canada I think like blackjack mm. uh, was the game um, and then when poker comes along then nothing else I think nothing else it, it changes a lot in a lot of uh, my friends my community my the, uh, people in, in, in Toronto and then like in the past 10 years definitely I see a lot of people like learning and get hooked on and um, love the game of poker so much. Now, I was 10 when I moved from England to Wales and, and it's a completely different country but they're landlocked you know it's part of the UK but I found it incredibly difficult because the culture was very different I was uh, half Chinese, everybody else was white. Uh, I, I had a different accent, found it really, really difficult. I can imagine moving to Canada in, in your teens was also very challenging, wasn't it? I think the, at that time I was like, you know, pretty excited to go. And after I was there for the first few years, I, I think I felt it pretty good because I'm not the type that, as I said, I'm from, from a straight family. Mm. So I wasn't like, you know, into a lot of parties or going out with a lot of friends in Hong Kong anyway. So I think I adopted okay. And at that time, my parents just left me uh, with my uncles. Uh, so they took good care of me and you're living with your uncle, definitely you try to be even a better boy at that yeah, time. Yeah. Until my parents like um, sold their business and their home in Hong Kong, then the whole family is in Toronto. Um, until I came back 10 years ago. And when you was in Toronto and you, you, you're in your teens and you, you're starting to think to yourself, right, I'm going to have to be a man soon, I'm going to have to start earning some money. What were your beliefs around money back then and how did you start earning it? I, I was like, you know, all along I'm, you know, into, uh, I guess I'm pretty, or people from Hong Kong or from Chinese, they always are more sharp on numbers hmm. uh, or math. Um, definitely, we are. I'm not the type who can write like uh, two thousand words of essays, you know, to sit there and read a lot of books. So, like uh, for math, numbers, and investment is always a uh, probably the field that I was leaning towards. And I can still remember my first job was into actually my first summer job was into um, entertainment. Actually, I was like working at a, a TV shop and somehow the TV shops has people that I know that uh, uh, later on moved me into um, entertainment business. We're doing concerts, uh, bringing in Hong my company that I worked for at that time, bringing mm -hmm. in stars from singers, movie stars from Hong Kong mm -hmm. and perform in uh, Toronto and Canada. So we were kind of, at that time, I was like kind of like more developed into the entertainment, uh, the marketing, and it helps in my um, personality right now into the poker business. Because I guess people tend not to like people just sit there and not talk on the table and be too cool and just want to take people's money. So we are the type that's like, you know, into interacting with players, you know, try to be their friends and learn more um, what players love about the game, how they're going to like the game more. And we, fortunately, I'm both a player and a, an operator. Hmm. So we understand uh, on both sides of the angle, how to make the game or my room better, uh, or the tournaments, how to fit them uh, 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 into the way that they will participate more. Uh, I think that helps in to the development of uh, my room and my tournaments. So how did you go from the entertainment business in Canada to eventually finding uh, the gambling industry in Pogo? Um, at that time, well, I, I still remember Toronto do not have any commercial casinos. They call charity casinos, right. which you can get a charity casino license and you have all your own little van that put all your tables there and then you have your dealers goes from location to locations at, com at 
convention halls. You can book convention halls and get um, government license to run as three days. Every every license only approved for three days. Mm -hmm. So you have to move from location to location uh, every three days. At that time, I think there are only three games: um, the blackjack, the big wheel, and poker. Right. And um, so it was the first time we uh, when they have that in the city. So obviously, we are the type of people that feel itchy and go check it out. And the first day, I still remember the first day that we, we they have poker. I, I hang around the rail and say, "What the hell is this? I don't know. What game is it?" Remember, we watch all those Chinese movies, and we think it's like a game of show hand. Similar? Is it similar to the type of things? What? What is? Why is this community card? There's three cards in the middle. Five What's cards. And what the hell is going on? Yeah. And after I watch it for like I think about a week or two, I ask people. I say the best thing is sit down and try. Then you learn faster. And I can still remember the first day I sat on that poker table, I was sitting with Daniel Nogrado. No way! The yes. first time you ever played poker. Yes. First time ever played poker. That's incredible. And then, like a good friend of mine, sitting down and play, and then she's a friend of uh, Daniel. And um, and that time, I still remember Ethel and Ng. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't want to say I can't remember. I think believe at that time those they they were dating at those times mm -hmm. long time ago. Um, my god sister are good friends with them. So I sit down and play, and then I didn't even know who he is, mm -hmm. and I thought he was just a dealer at some underground or some clubs. <laughs> and actually, at that time, he have not won his uh, have not won his bracelet yet. Right, early days. The first early days, it was like now expose my age. <laughs> I'll talk about that. And then, like you know, what an experience. Now I'm still you know good friends with Daniel. Oh, okay. One amazing players. And at that time we were playing limit poker. Right, right. There's no, not even no limit. There's limit poker like that those times. Can you remember the time when you decided that you were going to try to make some money out of it? Not just playing, but you know, through organization? Uh, at that time we just tried to learn the game. So mainly we were just focusing when I was young, you know, 20 ish. We just, you know, we were just thinking, hey, how to learn the game, improve the game. Uh, after Daniels, like won his first uh, no limit bracelet for Toronto, he got famous. He moved over there. Everybody look up to, hey, how can we be like that? Then mm. we, you know, and then like start more people looking into tournaments, looking and playing the tools, watching, starting at that time. We have um, WPT on the travel channels. Mm. So we started watching those on on Sunday, and then say like more people are in Toronto start getting into uh, tournaments. Then afterwards, they they uh, have the commercial casinos coming along. Then they have tournaments in the commercial casinos. So we start playing those, and then we start uh, aware of more watching those uh, in. Um, I guess when online came in, yeah, online poker come along. So people start qualifying. Or playing the satellites to win seats to the WSOP, and that time is really getting the booming. And then, like um, I guess, a few more years later, then we have the Chris Moneymaker, which makes everybody think, "Oh, anybody, anybody can win." Yeah. Normal, not only the pros now. Mm. Normal people can win the bracelet, which really is get a hit on. And then now, then then at that time, I start. Traveling to the states, to Vegas, to um, you know East Coast, maybe go to uh, New Jersey. Were you a professional poker player then when you were traveling around, or still? No, just... it was still like semi, like more amateur yeah. style. You know, uh, my family is having a restaurant business, hmm. and I was like uh, when I was like school, and then like finish school, I still uh, go to help them in the restaurant. But after I was like uh, graduated. I was working in the uh, automobile industry at that time, so it's nothing to totally nobody can think of it at that time. I say I was fixing cars. You was fixing them <laughs> or selling them? I'm not selling them. I was like, uh, I don't know whether you know this called service. There's a position called service advisor. Right. It's the people that you first seen. Uh huh. They bring the car in and say, tell the guy what's wrong. Yeah. Right. 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 The guy who put down what's wrong and send your car back. 
the position, then you take, take all the blame. So you're very unusual then, because most people I interview who's been in this seat, they just say, yeah, I just came straight out of university and I went straight to play poker. You, you've experienced some real life, Winfred. Yes, yeah, so restaurants and since I was a kid, I was doing mm -hmm. deliveries. I, I, every position of the restaurant I, I work, like uh, whoever stay off, I take that position. I, go, I do fried rice too, <laughs> <laughs> with the wok. <laughs> so how did you end up in Macau? Um, just happened. Um, it's, 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 it's not a, uh, a secret, but it was like a long story that uh, we were doing good. A whole bunch of people that we were doing good in, mm. uh, in Toronto and in, in my poker game. Right. So we started making a lot of money. Uh, when I was young, that's a lot of money to us. And then you know how poker players are. Then we get into the parties, get into more, uh, try to live the lifestyles of it. And then we will figure out, hey, why don't we, why, a whole bunch of us, they say, oh, we, why don't we go to people's party? We go to spend a lot of money in nightclubs. Why don't we build, we open our own nightclubs? Then I start opening our own nightclubs. Uh, so I got nightclubs in, in Toronto and uh, actually from one into two. And actually at the time we like getting into um, young, uh, think of making the money easy, easy on the table and start uh, getting into bad habits, too much partying. And one day then we just happened that something happened in, in my nightclubs. Because we, we are we are partners, we all just know how to play and party. Yeah. We bring the people, we pack the nightclub, but we don't know how to manage it. Right. And then up the, uh, my managers are stealing the money. Right. And they didn't even pay the tax for us. So something happened in the nightclub and the government found and then just come to sue us. So from then on is from heaven suddenly back to real life. Hmm. Then I have to declare bankruptcy. So after the declared bankruptcy and then like I started to figure out, oh my God, what happened? Then I realized I didn't need to even play poker much. And I tried to get back into, I, I was seeing my old friends and uh, I need help at that time. So mm -hmm. they put me back into the game, put me back into the, because I was totally broke. And into, um, go back to Vegas to play some tournaments, playing some, I can still remember that I don't even have my buy-in for my main event at that time. How did it feel to have to go, go to people and, and ask them for help and support? Actually, my other people said when I was doing good, I, you know, we were partners, we do that. And then like, uh, I move on to the uh, entertainment, to other industries, they stay in poker. Mm. But as long as they know that, you know, um, I'm not, uh, things happen, I'm not doing good. They, they actually, they, they, they come to offer. I didn't even have to ask. That's nice. Right. So I still appreciate it. And, um, and at that time I try to play more and all that. And then I get back some of the, uh, confidence and just happened. One of my good friends and is kind of like an uncle to me or a big brother. Hmm. He is in Hong Kong and Macau. So he said, hey, come, to, come back and see what opportunities. So I go there and I see, um, I think wind just open and I see there's some poker opportunities. I think poker stars just starting to be there hmm. uh, at Grand Water. I still remember the first location they has. It's only even have Galaxy and, and other locations yet. And then they open up the, um, the gaming license in, in Macau. So more Western or US casinos just about to get there. So I tried, they, they, they were asking for any varieties of people bringing something different. So I try to show them poker and bring them a proposal and all that. I guess they are too good about the background business then. So they think this kid, Canadian kid is crazy, <laughs> telling me to rake $200 per hand and to throw my proposal away, I think. I don't want to mention what casino at that time it was. Um, so I went back to Canada to grind another year. And I feel, hmm, maybe I should take a second shot at Macau. 
Is this, is this at the same time that Elton Sang was going from Canada to Macau as well? No, it was, I was way before that, ah. way before that. And then um, the second time I go, uh, it just happened Sun City is up on the rise. They are willing to try a lot of new things. Um, they are into both looking at the future about I guess uh, online business as well and also uh, development of their big land-based empire so they want varieties they're willing to try new stuff mm. and I'm sure everybody knows about um, Elvin Chow now the CEO of uh, Sun City um, I guess we are now Sun City definitely the number one junket in the world mm. not only in Macau um, then they look at it and say, okay, we want to do poker business. We want somebody to speak the language, somebody who have the Western experience and a Chinese mentality. So first they're there and then they say, okay, you're hired. Then I'm just there and then until now, basically. So after the first year, they, you know, I work in helping them to develop all the uh, logistics, for their um, any poker strategies and also uh, building the team for Poker King Club, mm. which uh, this Poker King Club when it's open, uh, I can give not only they give me opportunity to um, establish myself, but also uh, first two person that my boss introduced to me is Paul and Richard. Right. He said I. They love poker take care of them, they'll be your number one and two customers. And from then on, I think um, Paul and Richard never treat me like um, a worker over there. Mm. They treat me like, you know, from day one already, like friendly friends, like never think it's my, oh, it's my, you know, like uh, uh, Elvin's uh, workers or, you know, colleagues or something. And later on, you know, like not only I, um, take care of their poker games, set up games for them, and then like we travel. Um, I introduced the tournament scene to them. Right. And Rich is the first one who love it and get hooked onto it. And I travel with them, they bring the family, so we become, we become very close. So just like a family that we travel with Paul and Richard all the time and build the game. And then, as you know now that, you know, after all these years and uh, I feel like they need to own something, so I created Triton just for them. Can you, uh, can you remember when the first big Western Pro started to come over? I think the first tournament we, we hold, host after we opened the room, I think it's Tom Hall who's bringing in Tom Duan. Right. First time, the, uh, because APT, was already penetrated and having their rooms and uh, they have tournaments in uh, Star World where Poker King Club is it. So when Tom, also a good friend of Paul, start bringing in, um, I think as I remember the first, first person to bring in is Tom Duan. And then John Jawanda was old friends with, uh, with Paul already. So, and then he, then it comes Ivy. So three of them. <laughs> those Can't are, get much the, bigger the, than those three. Yes, those big three guys was like, you know, it's all the, when all the Chinese players and all the kids were looking at, wow, are we on TV or something, you know? So everybody's like, you know, uh, in, in Poor King Club, suddenly it becomes the, you know, where, where the all the big, the the, the big, not only the games are big, hmm. but they can come in and see the idols play. You know, they just want to be there when my, when, you know, to see where, where I want to play in the same room where, where Ivy and Duan is playing. Just like when, when, when we were younger, when we go there, we want to go to the Bobby's room, you know, we yeah, want to see, yeah. you know, who's playing in there, you know, when I was, when we were just playing the small game, we want, we like to be outside playing that small game in Bellagio because I want to see my big, my, my, the big names playing in there, you know. Uh, at that time, Paul King uh, create that kind of effect in the scene. So not only the sticks are 
I'm sure is the highest stake uh, hold them game at that time. That was crazy at that time. And uh, you, so you go from being broke, uh, you go over to Macau, uh, all of a sudden you develop like the biggest game in the world. You've got Ivy playing it, Duan playing it, all over Western Pro. So as they're making, uh, you know, as that's making money, you're making more money. How, how, how do you feel around that time with your, your, your income rising at the same time? Did your life change a lot? Um, I still remember the first day I went to, I pack up my stuff, I go to Macau, I only have 50,000 Hong Kong in my whole pocket and try to feed three, three families, including myself. Hmm. Um, from then on, I think I did not change much because I, um, actually all my uh, people that in Toronto, that my whole team before, I said like, when I'm successful and bring you guys back, I'm, this is, you can see right now in these, in a lot of my teams, Mm. They are mostly come from Toronto, right? With me, so I definitely, um, I guess, like for outside people who look at it, wow, you you are high roller now. You 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 know you're driving a, a Lamborghini, you're driving a Ferrari. Why you know you you're living such a good life? Um, but they didn't know that like um, for the past ten years, like. Maybe we, we have to be stay in the poker room for uh, 48 hours. Uh, having a lot of stress over, you know, the game so big. Uh, help my boss to control the credit. You know, that is also an issue. Uh, not everybody's allowed um, to bring that much cash into crossing the countries. I'm still, I think now it's more difficult uh, to run the bigger games or bigger tournaments that, than then. Uh, that already at that time, we did a lot of controls. Um, definitely the casino and my boss are happy because a lot of high rollers are in Macau, mm. right? Um, I think it's like, uh, I, myself, I don't think I changed my life much and I still enjoy uh, either running the business or sitting on the table. Definitely, I guess I, I lie. <laughs> I enjoy more sitting on you're the like, table. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Definitely. But you're, you're, not, you're not silly enough to try to do it full time though. Right. But like, you know, um, you know at, at the beginning time that we have to deal with the casinos, the marketing, the office, taking on the customers while they're entertaining them, taking good care of them because uh, we are trying to take poker into a different notch. The VIP styles, people who go to the junket, they have the service. We give the poker player the same service. We try to yeah, do that. it was it was it, it was different, wasn't it? It's not just come and play poker. It's come and play poker, and we will look after you and give you the experience we feel that you want to have. It's different, isn't it? Yes, because like every casino, honestly, everybody doesn't like poker players. Yeah, you know they don't give much action to to the rest of the casinos, and then always they were thinking they see at the poker table. You order like one coffee, one Coke and two bottles of water and then like tipping one dollar. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. Poker players are like that, you know. Uh, we try to change the style of it. Not only because of the uh, different rec system or different uh, programs or different uh, management that we use in Macau, but definitely um, compared to Vegas or compared to the rest of other countries, uh, the cost in Macau about running a poker room is substantially higher right. and also uh, the most valuable is the poker tables because uh, Macau every casinos are licensed to a certain number of tables they have a table cap yeah so they're giving me a poker table means they're losing one background table or a blackjack table it's a lot of money so it's, a, it's always a, f a, a kind of a, a fight between me and the uh, and the casinos or the or the, uh, or the licensee, mm. uh, the licensor of, of the casinos about how to get more tables to accommodate my players. But in the meantime, if you are the casino owner, they were asking me, you know, a poker table that generate maybe like forty fifty thousand dollars $50,000 while a baccarat table can generate, you know, hundred and fifty dollars to $200,000 per day. Mm. What would you do? Yeah, difficult. Right? So I have to uh, like try to uh, play both roles in the middle, how to tell them, ah, this brings in, if I have this poker, six poker tables, 
That means the poker player's wife was gonna be on the slot machines. Their fathers will play, you know, background. And when they lost about five aces, got bad beat, they go on tilt. They will go to <laughs> blackjack table. It's, it's so interesting because uh -huh. it's obvious that you need to be able to communicate and communicate effectively um, and and intelligently with different people. Yet you came from a background where your communications with other people was stymied a little bit because you didn't go out the house. You didn't. Uh, you know, you didn't get that yeah. practice in. You know? I guess that's just I was born with that. I say you know, maybe uh, there's something that um, I was born with, as I said. Mm. You know, like uh, although I didn't hang out much in the community when I was like young, but uh, I guess my first job get into the uh, entertainment industry, yeah. so doing the concerts, which make me uh, open me up a lot about seeing how to communicate with people, how to communicate with the. Uh, the celebrities, the stars, the working people, all that. Um, in you know, I have to play both roles. In you know, go with when I when when I have to deal with the casinos, so I have to stand on like to to play some number games with them. Hey, what we do, what we can provide. You give me to you know, I promise you like how many tournaments per year, or how many people I'm bringing in. Um, to worth your while to give me the poker room, or you know. All these things, and definitely um, to play along with that, and the uh, and then comes the VIP. How to make them because they get used to the junket service. How to let them to have the same service into poker, and um, also um, of course, a lot of other players that are bringing from um, from all over the world. They want entertainment in Macau. Mm. Same thing. Right. All poker players do while they hang around in Vegas. They yeah. enjoy the lifestyle. Mm. Not only that, then we have to how to develop in uh, newer players or people from China or people from the rest of Asia to be interested in this game. Right. So it's 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 it's, it's an all around thing. Sounds yeah. like you have your work cut out. And and I guess it's even more challenging now because of all the legislation and the rules, and uh, there's been a lot of changes in Asia recently in poker. How much has that put a stranglehold on what you're doing? I, I think um, they're, they're looking into uh, before. Uh, we are still, all poker tournaments or poker companies are still third party companies. They do not have gaming license in Macau. They have to work with a casino who has the gaming license. And the casinos are not, not all of them are very experienced with poker in Asia. So um, it's, it's difficult for us to provide, we have to provide a lot of stuff in order to make a poker tournament or a poker room happen. And um, with certain incidents or um, maybe um, the Macau governments are looking into more um, regulations need to be done, yeah. right? To make sure um, all the third parties are working under the same scope. You know, uh, with Sun City, with us, we don't have a problem. But sometimes, like other brands coming into Macau and all that, not everybody are familiar with the rules and the regulations. I'm not saying anybody is uh, trying to break the rules or regulations intentionally. Yeah. But because you work with some in, in maybe in US or maybe in Europe or maybe something like here, it's very easy to get things going on. But in Macau, are very straight. Just like if, if in Macau for now, even though as you know, uh, so many times we last time we run Triton, mm. we tried to get the live stream going. We didn't get a it's very difficult to get something like that to yeah, be approved, yeah. which the rest of the world are so simple, right? Must be frustrating. Yes, mm. and before um, we can do much bigger po uh, poker tournaments in the ballroom because uh, the gaming areas are very compact or they do not want to do a lot of changes. But now the, uh, the regulations put in a lot of, uh, uh, they said now in, in the ballroom you can use it. But every table has to have certain cameras, securities, all these things all set up. 
then they bring the cost up too high. Mm. So a lot of people were backed out from it. So that it takes, uh, no matter how hard we work sometimes, it always some kind of a little setback in Macau for that. Um, our, our poker rooms are in uh, Philippines, in Korea, in Cambodia. Um, of course, those locations are much easier for me to uh, work with or easy to get what we we'd like to accomplish. Mm. But definitely still Macau, the number one location in the Holy Grail, the Holy Grail when it all, it's when it no all comparison, no comparison. Yeah, yeah. You know, no matter how hard we work, what kind of uh, service we provide in other uh, cities or countries in Asia, mm. still people feel more com most comfortable about playing poker or having their tournaments has to be still number one choice, Macau, no doubt about it, hands down. You said, uh, you said earlier on, or you didn't say it, but you, you expressed that friendship is a really important value for you. You talked about going back to Toronto and, and saying, hey, come on over here, we've got a job for you, the people who looked after you. What other values are, are really important to you and to lead your life by? I think, um, to me, I feel like, uh, uh, especially um, in, I, I, I'm not sure in, it was it in other business as well, but uh, I think my personality or my principle is to uh, remember who helped you and who's your teammate and never leave your teammate behind if you are successful. I like that. Right. And you also mentioned that you are into charity as well, right? Have you, you've got involved in that. You want to talk about that a little bit? Yes, it's like, uh, as I, to I told you before we started the interview, that uh, I just set up a uh, charity in Macau. Um, we, I always did before that we have donate money and have players donating money, and I was involved in a uh, poker players um, uh, group about in China about donating their winnings. Um, but I feel like in I'd like to establish something at this stage uh, because we have been there for 10 years. Uh, I just get my, we just get our license uh, for a charity for to helping children. I'm gonna give you the full name and all that later. Mm -hmm. um, we try to, um, I think we, we still, that I feel myself is still very limited to what I can do about uh, for my winnings or more for my uh, tournament winnings that I give back to the community. Now, uh, try to have some players to get involved as well. So we get our tournaments winning certain percentage will give back to, to donate to this charity. This charity will helping the children and the, um, the single parent families and in China and in Macau and Hong Kong. So I feel like um, we didn't directly affect anybody's life and maybe um, persons are getting too, too much into spending too much time into uh, the games, not only poker or any other games. Um, their families might not like it or mm. their children get affected. Yeah. So I think uh, for us, if I can do something that we like, uh, that's just the, um, the category, so the, the type of charity work that I like to do, to take care of their children. Yeah, I like it. And mm. for people listening to this, what, what tips would you give them in terms of how to become successful? Not necessarily successful in poker, but you've been successful in life. So what are, the, what are the key ingredients, do you think, that have got you there? Well, honestly, I don't even think I'm successful. I think, <laughs> I, I think you're successful. When I, look at, when I look at Paul Richard and then like, you know, my, a lot of, um, at certain times, when I, when I say, wow, I got my poker club, I got this, I open it up in more rooms in there. And then like, you know, um, I feel like, you know, I'm very successful. But as I go along in, in Asia, I see a lot of people uh, having their business and all that. And then like very humble, a lot of, of course, because other people are um, 
showing more of their success. But you know, uh, as I as I go along these years, and I, I find myself very tiny into this. You know, I think there's still a lot of things to to learn and improve. But I uh, no not much tips I can give. But I think uh, the most important: don't compare yourself with others, because you will never finish comparing. Now today, I think I as I said a couple of years ago, I think like you know. I'm on top of the world, and then now all of a sudden I find out, hey, I'm a nobody. <laughs> the world's a bit bigger than what I thought it <laughs> yeah, was. Yeah, then, then you start thinking like, as long as you enjoy what you're doing. So a lot of my friends say like, are very, they, they always said like, they're very jealous. That your work is your entertainment. Hmm. Your, and your work is, <laughs> you're playing while you're at work. Yeah. So um, actually, I, I'm, I'm doing a lot of uh, going back to invest in restaurants and open my, uh, my restaurants in Macau, Hong Kong, and now in Manila. Uh, not switching my business around, but um, it's something that I always enjoy doing. Uh, I think enjoying life and never stop learning is very important. Learning from, then you search, and then you find out what your mistake or what you are missing, but don't try to compare the success between yourself and others because you will never, you're always behind, you'll be always be chasing. Wise advice. And finally, how do you feel? How does playing high stakes poker make you feel? Um, stress. <laughs> <laughs> I think it's like the game changes a lot from seven, eight years ago until and now, not only the players improve the games, uh, I would say bad players who maybe uh, cannot be bad all the time. They improve, they become good. And some bad players, they just don't play this game anymore. Just like when I, you know, if I play tennis with the pros, sometimes I will say, oh, I'll give up, or I play golf and say like, I'll give up, I'll play something else. Obviously, it always says some other players drop out of poker and go something else. So new players coming in and with the new system, the kids, uh, with all this help about learning the game, how to play this way. Um, with my time that I'm not able to be focusing 100% in improving my games. So I'm becomes more into uh, amateur players having fun. Mm. More important than be uh, very seriously grinding the game. Uh, so that's why now playing high six very stressful for me. <laughs> <laughs> well, um, thank you for joining us today. I hope this has been less stressful than the game you're just about to go and play. <laughs> definitely, definitely. Thank Win you very much. Winfred Yu, thanks for joining us and I'm high six poker. Thank you. I'm Winfred Yu, I'm high stake poker. <laughs>